rounds in the forest, in Yorkshire, in Wales, and in Scotland. Three rounds on tarmac, the circuit of Ireland, the Ulster, and the Manx, all making up the Shell Oils RAC Open Rally Championship. Great events that have produced great champions. Roger Clark, champion in 1965, 72, 73, and 75. Hanu Mikola with co-driver Arnie Hertz, the champion in 1978. Ari Vatanen, 76 and 80. Russell Brooks, eight years, spanned his victories in 77 and 85. But the Shell Gemini driver Jimmy McRae was going for title number five in 1988. Drivers like these, experts on the forest and the tarmac. And the cars built to withstand the toughest challenges of the Shell Oils Open Championship. Inside David Llewellyn's Shell Gemini Audi Quattro with the co-driver Phil Short. The co-driver's job is partly that of office manager, organizing the paperwork and the meticulous timing involved in the sport. But on the special stages, their workload can vary. Up till this year, the forest events in the Open Championship were non-pace note rallies. So no reconnoitering of the route, and the co-driver can only give occasional guidance from the route book provided by the organizers start to the Shell Oils Open Championship, the Forests of Yorkshire, an event once known as the Mintex Rally, won in 1978 and here in 1981 by Penty Auricola. Penty in 78 at the wheel of a Vauxhall Chevette, but the Ford Escort RS gave him the win three years later. Same car, same event, Ari Vatanen. But also a double winner of the Mintex Rally, Hanu Mikola, 1980 and 82. And when the event became the National Breakdown Rally in 1984, Mikola won it again. The characteristic of the rally is either mud or snow, and it was never tougher than in 1986, when an overnight blizzard made things very picturesque, but caused the early abandonment of the event, but not before Hanu Mikola had scored victory number four. Perhaps the worst weather combination was in 1987, mud, snow and ice. Graphic illustration of the kind of problems that provides came from Russell Brooks and Mike Broad as they sped past the steep drop of Rickledale. Right, we're going. First gear. Start it. Not the first frightening moment Mike Broad has had alongside Russell Brooks in the Opal Manta, but it underlines the challenge of this Yorkshire rally. If the snow and ice doesn't get you, the mud will. Master of the mud in 1987 was once again Penty Auricola at the wheel of an Opal Manta for the first time. Penty claimed his third win on the event, one short of Hanu Mikola's record. That was the National Breakdown Rally. For 1988, the season's opener took on a new sponsor and became the Cartel International. Nineteen eighty-eight saw a complete return to Group A rallying, and for Penty Auricola, a car new to the British sport, the Mitsubishi Starion Turbo. New car for David Llewellyn, one of the most exciting talents in the British sport, the Shell Gemini Audi 200 Quattro. Also carrying the Shell Gemini colours, defending champion Jimmy McRae, two-wheel drive Ford Sierra Cosworth, and a new co-driver in Rob Arthur. Britain's top woman rally driver, Louise Aitken-Walker, 
in the 1.9 litre Peugeot 205 GTI. And Malcolm Wilson with a Ricola, the only other previous winner in the field. Wilson, now at the wheel of the Vauxhall Astra GTE, won the event in 1985. But Penty would get the 1988 championship underway. Last year's winner, away from the Cartel International start in Bradford, carrying our onboard camera. But it was the champion McRae, first man through the opening stage at Harewood House. The conditions murky, but mild. Llewellyn well in the big Audi, keen to start the excitement as quickly as possible. And despite moments like that, it was Llewellyn who was quickest on the opening stage, a few seconds faster than Auricola in the Mitsubishi. Malcolm Wilson's season with GM has already started well with an eighth place in Sweden on the second round of the World Championship. He was looking for a similar result with the Vauxhall Astra here. Also front-wheel drive, Louise Aitken Walker in the 1.9-litre Peugeot 205. Louise's teammate, Callie Grunville, had a brand-new 1.9-litre Peugeot 309. And a now familiar sight on the Open Championship, back to contest another year, John Hogland in the Skoda. Harewood House, though, was just a warm-up for the real rally in the Yorkshire Forest, where conditions were the best in recent years. In all, 36 stages over two days, totaling 200 stage miles. Llewellyn had started well, so too had Auricola. On board in the Mitsubishi, no pace notes allowed on the event, so all co-driver Ronan McNamee has to do is give the occasional guidance. Apart from that, he just sits back and admires the talent in the driver's seat. Looks OK. Within a couple of forest stages, Auricola was into the lead, using most of the car's 280 horsepower. The well-in, by contrast, was finding the Audi a little down on power, and the dry, surprisingly dusty stages weren't making the best use of the car's four-wheel drive. Jimmy McRae, with a new co-driver, was making a cautious start, but Rob Arthur alongside him is one of the most experienced men in the sport, and they were holding on to a comfortable third place. Bill Collins, you may remember, was the man leading last year's Manx rally before crashing out on the second day. Since then, they've painted the car pink, and I'm afraid to say he and co-driver Brian Thomas wear pink overalls as well. But despite the colour scheme, they were fourth in the Ford Sierra Cosworth. Then came the Peugeots, sharing fifth place. This is Louise Aitken Walker in the 205, driving as well as ever. Her performance in the RAC rally, where she was challenging the top ten, was obviously a tremendous boost to her confidence. Swedish teammate Kali Grundle in the 309 GTI struggles to keep in touch. And he's a man with a great amount of world championship experience. A surprise seventh place for Gwyndaf Evans in a Group N Sierra Cosworth. Group N means it's effectively a standard showroom car. He shared that seventh place with Dave Metcalf's Vauxhall Astra. Metcalf's teammate, Malcolm Wilson, was fighting his way back through the field after breaking a drive shaft on the third stage. Penty Auricola, though, was avoiding the major problems to keep the Mitsubishi at the head of the field. Auricola twitching the car through the mist of the forest, while on board it was still admiring silence. Straight through.
hard left coming. Problems would come for Penty, though, as he lost third gear for three stages, the gear he used most, and his lead over Llewellyn was just four seconds. Llewellyn himself, though, couldn't close the gap. The car still that fraction down on power. It was quite clear, though, that it was a fascinating battle at the front, the leading three evenly matched. Auricola, Llewellyn, and Jimmy McRae in the Ford Sierra Cosworth. McRae, after eight stages, a mere second behind Llewellyn, the smallest possible margin. This is Dave Metcalf in the Vauxhall Astra. Alongside Metcalf, Mike Broad, Russell Brooks's former co-driver, Metcalf was making him feel at home. Metcalf trying to take the shortest possible route, hitting a tree stump and very nearly reaching the point of no return. Meanwhile, the other Vauxhall Astra was up to eighth, Malcolm Wilson continuing his fight back. Also eighth, but dropping down the field, Cali Grundle, losing power and losing oil. He's soon to retire. John Haugland can normally be relied on for a solid finish in the Skoda, but not this time. Haugland would shortly go out with a broken gearbox. And that would leave Colin McRae in a strong position to challenge in the 1300cc class in his Vauxhall Nova. Heading into the night, and Llewellyn has sorted his problems and is back into the lead. We had a problem. Stage five, uh, over a jump, we broke uh, a front strut and we had to do several stages uh, with the car like that. We didn't have time to change it. And we had a, an engine problem. It wasn't pulling in between four and 5,000 RPM. Uh, but the lads now have sorted it all out and we're, we're going better. We've taken the lead back now. So uh, only, I think, 10 seconds over Penty and 20 over Jimmy. It's uh, still quite close, but uh, we are taking time off them now instead of them taking time off us. We are second at the moment, and uh, if the stages are fast, we are fastest, but if the stages are slippery and twisty, then David Llewellyn is going very well for stages, so it's, we shall see. I suppose uh, tomorrow I think the stages will be faster ones, so it should be all right if we are brave enough. Daylight sees a dramatically different leaderboard. Auricola still leads, but there's no Llewellyn and no McRae. Instead, it's the Mitsubishi with a five-minute lead from Louise Aitken Walker's Peugeot, and then the Ford Sierras of Bertie Fisher and Gwyndaf Evans. The story of all that, as an unchallenged Auricola, comes into sight. In the darkness, Llewellyn had been first to go, developing a problem with water in the fuel that rapidly forced his retirement. McRae then, trying to force the pace, went off the road in Dolby Forest and ran out of time trying to retrieve the situation. Another casualty of the night, Bill Collins, which meant all the pressure was off Auricola as long as the car kept going. If the Mitsubishi faltered, then Louise Aitken Walker in the Persia was there to pick up the pieces. Nobody had profited more from the overnight carnage than the popular Alsterman Bertie Fisher, up to third in the Ford Sierra Cosworth. 
He's got ahead of Gwyndaf Evans, content to maintain his Group N lead rather than challenge those ahead. Attacking the top five, Graham Middleton's Toyota, leading the 1600cc Group A class. And making up for his father's absence, Colin McRae in the Vauxhall Nova was now seventh. McRae driving with all the flair of his father. Dave Metcalf had problems and dropped to 13th, but teammate Malcolm Wilson was another to go out overnight. Back at the head of the field, Auricola could now afford to drop the pace. Auricola heading for victory number four in the Yorkshire Forest, and the Mitsubishi was thought to be a car better suited to tarmac. Yorkshire Forest, notoriously tough on tyres. For Auricola, Pirelli came prepared for everything, especially snow. But in the absence of winter, Auricola had opted for the wider tyres that took Ewer Kankinen to victory on the RAC. From the wheels up, there were no problems for the rally leader. No problems either for Louise Aitken Walker, apart from the widening gap to the man in front. Louise heading for her best ever international result. And with Bertie Fisher gone, Gwyndaf Evans up to third. Fisher went out when the car suspension broke after hitting a log. Two minutes behind, Graham Middleton, Toyota. Chris Birkbeck up to seventh in a Vauxhall Astra. It was all changing very rapidly in the lower part of the top ten. The battered Ford of Steve Hill after an excursion, but he's going well and amazingly has made it three Group N cars in that top ten. Dave Metcalf also with signs of having gone off. Metcalf had rolled, so the Kendall man was still 13th when, given what was happening to the rest of the field, he should have been on for a place in the top three. But now a broken drive shaft is wiping out any hope of making a climb back through the field. Closing on him on the stage, the Nova with a flapping tailgate, is that of Harry Hockley. Here's Hockley in the air-conditioned Nova. Remember that Hockley is ahead of Metcalf in the rally order, and the cars on the stages are racing the clock and not each other. Fifty left six. But for the rally leader, Auricola, it's a racing finish, with the final stage on the Oliver's Mount race circuit just outside Scarborough. And right eight, Hairpin. Walker was just over seven minutes behind the Mitsubishi at the close. Then came Gwyndaf Evans to win Group N and get a place in the top three. The Group N car surprisingly quick throughout the field. The Group N Mazda that forced its way into fourth was that of David Maslin. Even though fifth place Graham Middleton appeared to be quicker on Oliver's Mount. Ramon Ferreros, sixth, his best open championship finish, but a lot of drivers in this unlikely top ten were able to say the same. For Colin McRae in seventh, we can expect a lot more well-placed finishes. It should be a very bright rallying future for the young man from Lanark. 50, right six long. But the man who'd seen off McRae senior was now putting on a final show for the Oliver's Mount crowd before claiming victory. Uh, it was the first time I drove a car. I drove about one hour before the rally, or tested it in airfield, but uh, 
it's obviously it's, uh, I wasn't really driving well with a car in the early part of rally and I was learning about it and, and so on. Keep left for finish. Well done. When uh, uh, David Lullin retired, we were one second behind him and catching him, and uh, because we had this gearbox problem earlier, so we lost some time, and when we were catching quite a lot, so we felt very confident about it. And when Jimmy went off, uh, we were over a minute ahead of him anyhow, and going very well, so... And we didn't re never really needed to stretch ourselves, and so we went all right. Cartel International Rally. Penti Ricola with Ronan the same scene in Bradford as exactly 12 months ago. Round one of the Shell Oils RAC Open Championship is over. The same winner, but for an Opel Manta 400, Reed Mitsubishi Starion. Louise Aitken Walker second, Gwyndaf Evans third in the Group N Ford Sierra. But expect the more familiar names to be back on the leaderboard for round two, the Circuit of Ireland at Easter. There was a time when the Circuit of Ireland was genuinely that, a flat-out loop of the coastline that provided one of the great tests of the sport. Paddy Hopkirk was the master then, stacking up a record six Circuit of Ireland wins in a combination of the Hillman and the Mini Cooper. A gruelling event, but one which Paddy seemed able to turn into a light-hearted jaunt. It may be an Easter date, but snow is always a possibility on the circuit. Paddy Hopkirk completed his five victories in 1967, a while before Jimmy McRae arrived on the scene, that he would make a definite impact on circuit history. Ari Vatanen, a frequent visitor, a man who always had a moment for the spectators. When he wasn't giving spectators moments of their own. The circuit of Ireland, fast, narrow, twisting lanes, the view from the headlamp of the Rothmans Porsche, and the graphic view that Billy Coleman has from the driver's seat. Okay, back it again. If the 60s belong to Hopkirk, the 80s on the circuit of Ireland belong to Jimmy McRae. A hat-trick of victories in 80, 81 and 82, victory again in 85, and then at the wheel of the Ford Sierra Cosworth, he equaled Hopkirk's record with his fifth win in 1987. In 1988, it would be McRae going for win number six on the Rothmans Circuit of Ireland. Joining the fray, the reigning Irish tarmac champion and the 1986 Shell Oils RAC Open champion, Mark Lovell, who was carrying the onboard camera in the Shell Gemini liveried Ford Sierra Cosworth. Later in this production, complete stages from alongside Lovell and co-driver Ronan Morgan, which you can follow along with Ronan's pace notes as Lovell sets a blinding early pace. But for now, just a taste of that as Lovell, having started on the 500-mile route that began in Belfast and finishes in Dublin, sets that pace that leaves the others trailing. 20 easy left. 60 long medium right opens. 40, long, medium, left. 20, caution, slow, medium, right. 20, brow, easy, right. 20, wet, mud, K, left. 50, brow, tight, K, left, gravel, to right. And left, maybe. To brow, 30, 90, right, mud. 20, brow, long left, maybe, to caution, brow. And slow left, into hairpin right. In, and hairpin left. To medium right, and brow. 30, easy right. 50, long easy left, opens over 70. To long left, maybe. 20, easy right. 30, K left. 20, easy right, to long, easy left. 30, easy right, 30, caution left over pump. 
So after the first two stages, it's Lovell ahead with the Sierra Cosworths prominent right through the top five, apart from Llewellyn, who's forced his way into third. Other challengers, Cali Grundle had the new Peugeot 309 GTI and pronounced himself happy, apart from the need for stiffer suspension. And there's Penti Auricola, who took the Mitsubishi Starion to victory in the opening round of the championship in the forests of Yorkshire. But the tarmac was proving rather more of a struggle. Penti lost about 30 seconds with a spin on the second stage, and further time was being lost with a misfire. Malcolm Wilson once again led the GM Dealer Sport Challenge in his Astra GTE and looked in good form as he powered into the top six. Aitken Walker once again in Peugeot's 205 GTI, just holding the advantage over her teammate Callie Grundle. And always a contender, at least for class honours, Skoda. Just over 100 horsepower and competing in the up to 1300cc class, John Horglund leading the way here. Not able to compete with the Sierra Cosworths for spectacle, though. Spitting flame here is the great Irish favourite, Bertie Fisher. And the garish colours of Phil Collins, but here's a man going flat out and rewarded early on with second place. Stage four near Banbridge, and the rally leader Mark Lovell sets about extending his lead, no doubt boosted by the news that fifth place man David Llewellyn is out of the rally, the Audi blowing a piston. Lovell's car handling badly, the car needed extensive attention before the event with the replacement engine and new wiring, but Lovell, who won the Ulster rally last season, getting the best out of it. Nevertheless, McRae was now second and closing. The misfire that troubled him early on is now cured. Third place, Phil Collins in what's unkindly called the paraffin delivery van. to fourth, helped by the demise of Llewellyn, is Malcolm Wilson in the Astra GTE. Wilson alongside Jimmy McRae's championship winning co-driver Ian Brindrod. <laughs> Delaying Bertie Fisher had been a slight misfire plus an overshoot on the second stage but now the local favourite starting to climb up the leaderboard and doing it in entertaining fashion. Auricola, disappointingly off the pace in the early stages, also working hard to repair the situation. We join Penty and co-driver Ronan McNamee on stage five. And coming up, an example of how much a driver depends on a co-driver. A pace note call has been misheard. They're going about 50 miles an hour too fast. Important points of interest to watch out for here. The panic-stricken hands, as the mistake is realized, are on the farm gate as well. In the interests of decency, we thought it best not to eavesdrop on the dialogue at this point. Suffice to say, there was a rather robust inquest. For a while, they relied on gesticulations, but by the end of the stage, okay. the sense of humour had returned. As you know, in London, the skate crash parties are very fashionable, so we decided to have a middle of a special state gate crash party and went through the skate. Um, normally, you open the gate 
this way, but this went over the <laughs> roof of a car. What happened was really that uh, I misheard the previous corner, the base note, and uh, we used a number system. And I thought the Ronan said uh, left two, as he said actually left five. And it is about 50 miles per hour difference. And uh, so I went 50 miles too fast into the next corner. And then uh, was the only way to go through this gate and make a handbrake turn and 180 degree and come back. There wasn't any gate anymore when I came back. As the second day got underway in the Dublin showground, Mark Lovell had less to smile about. He hit a tree the previous evening and failed to limp out of the stage. So leading the circuit of Ireland now, Jimmy McRae. The showground has now become a traditional opener for the spectators. Little impact on the main event. That was to come later on the lanes of Southern Ireland en route to Waterford. In second now, Phil Collins. The first day had been one of surprising attrition with the 75 starters cut by over 20. So all drivers treating the twisty roads with great respect. That was certainly the case for Malcolm Wilson in third, about 40 seconds behind the leader. Glimpsed through the trees, Bertie Fisher. He couldn't afford to back off too much, but when you get things wrong on these narrow lanes, it's difficult to recover. So Fisher here, a minor spin in which he clouted a bank, he's forced to reverse out of the stage, losing valuable seconds in his climb back up through the field that's seen him go from 10th to 4th. Fisher's other problems have included suspension trouble and a broken anti-roll bar. way off the top three but he's ahead of Penti Auricola who's fifth. Here is the Mitsubishi and on board Dublin is once again in communication with Helsinki. Their problem now is electrical. Junction left in. Left it. Stopped again. Oh f you stay there. seconds tick away. Bertie Fisher takes more time out of Auricola. And we're into right eight long. Auricola determined to claw back some oh, of the lost it. seconds, and Ronan McNamee, well, he's clunk clicked just in time. Oh. <laughs> it's a problem that was to drop Penty way down the leaderboard, way behind Dave Metcalf, in fact, who's now a comfortable fifth in the Astra GTE. Ali Grundle, sixth in the Peugeot, but much rearranged after going off the road. Chris Birkbeck had moved his Astra GTE into seventh. That was as far as he'd get. Birkbeck soon to retire with a transmission problem. McRae, though, was now looking like a man in charge of the event, and the car performing perfectly on arrival at Waterford, needing no more than routine servicing. <laughs> Phil Collins, by contrast, was looking like a man who'd settled for second, over two and a half minutes behind at the Waterford Halt. A minute further back, Malcolm Wilson. And 
Waiting for any problems with the runners ahead, Bertie Fisher in four. Bertie making brake adjustments all day, now with the car sorted and looking very solid. You had to look down to fifth for a man under pressure, and that was Dave Metcalf, who was rapidly being threatened by a swiftly recovering auricula. And here is Penty. After his problems, you now have to admire the scale of the Finnish driver's attack. And left four, break into junction, left seven. Left seven. Into right seven, into left seven minus. And right three, into right seven, suddenly jump left six. Into left two, suddenly crest one, and right four opens over crest. Left two, 100, right four minus. Auricula swiftly overhauled Cali Grundle to take sixth place by Waterford. Grundle hung on to seventh. Looking further down to tenth, Graham Middleton making up the time in the Toyota after making a wrong tyre choice early on. Louise Aitken Walker, having lost around six minutes since her earlier excursion, is also recovering to twelfth by Waterford. McRae, Collins, Wilson then the first three, followed by Fisher and Metcalf as on day three the field turned back to the finish in Dublin. way to a record equaling sixth victory on the circuit of Ireland, Jimmy McRae driving well within himself to beat Paddy Hopkirk's record of success on this famous event. In second place, also in a Ford Sierra Cosworth, Phil Collins fighting a small brake problem but still heading for one of his best championship finishes. But behind him, disappointment for Ireland as Bertie Fisher went off the road on the final morning. Out of the event, third place goes to Malcolm Wilson in the Astra GT. Similar car behind him, that driven by Dave Metcalf. But Metcalf had taken fourth only by a single second after a stirring drive from fifth place Penty Auricola. Oh. The electrical problem now cured, Penty finishes his eventful rally with a brave challenge on the final morning. A minute and a half behind in sixth, the Peugeot 309 GTI of Cali Grundle, also showing signs of an incident pack three days. Good finish from Andrew Wood, taking seventh in a standard engine Golf GTI. And Louise Aitken Walker, regretting all her lost time of the first day, showed what might have been by climbing up the leaderboard to eighth in the Peugeot 205. And ninth place to Graham Middleton, whose steering problems in the Toyota gave him some frightening moments on the final day. 
but no moments of doubt for Jimmy McRae, the master of the Circuit of Ireland. 13 attempts at the event, six times a winner. Rob Arthur, the co-driver, McRae from Collins, both in Ford Sierras, followed by the Astros of Wilson and Metcalf. Drivers' Championship after two rounds still sees Penty Auricola ahead from Louise Aitken Walker, David Maslin, the Group N driver, third, McRae really starting the defense of his title by moving into sixth. And the Manufacturers' Championship, Ford with a 10-point lead over Peugeot. Round three now takes the championship back into the forests for the Welsh International. <laughs> Forests of Wales, country that over the years has served the top Scandinavians well. Hanu Mikola, double winner in 78 and 79 in the Ford Escort. Bjorn Baldegard on the tarmac sections of Epint, en route to victory in 82. Stig Blomquist, the winner the following year. And Malcolm Wilson in the Audi Quattro scored British success in 1985, matched by Russell Brooks in 87. But Hanu Mikola's victories spanned a decade. He won in 84 and again in 86, the swan song of the Group B cars. The year when David Llewellyn, desperate for a home victory, hounded Mikola right through the final day, until a mistake in the rain saw him launch the car from high off a hillside to a riverbank below, from where he and co-driver Phil Short were lucky to emerge unscathed. We were still on the wheels coming down across the, uh, across the bank there. Um, but I could see it was going to end up in a pretty uh, big accident. When we hit the, the road here, then it started going end over end. Actually landed on its roof, did it? Yes, the boys have actually just tipped it over to see whether they can drag it out from here to, to take it home yeah. in a box. <laughs> <laughs> Llewellyn's next competitive stage on the Welsh International was there for the following year. The opening spectator stage in 1987, now at the wheel of the Audi Quattro, still with Phil Short alongside him, and still a little over-anxious for Welsh success. <laughs> An inauspicious start from which Llewellyn recovered, but plagued by ignition problems, he was never able to get into a really challenging position. Here on the famous Esker David Forest stage, a puncture is finally putting pay to his hopes of becoming the first Welsh winner of the Welsh International for 21 years. But he'd be in there battling in 1988, round three of the Shell Oils Open Championship, the Fram Filters Welsh International. Jimmy McRae certainly knows those problems. Six times a winner of the Circuit of Ireland, but so often second on his home event in Scotland. But here in Wales, 180 forest stage miles to come through the tough complexes like Breckford, Dovey and Haffron. So understandably, a gentle start with a chance for the big crowds to get a good look at the cars in a series of spectator stages. This is Llewellyn with a new engine in the Audi 200 and with four-wheel drive obviously happy about the damp stages. The two Llandau stages enabled the drivers to get a good look at each other as well. Llewellyn pursued by the Ford Sierra Cosworth of Mark Lovell. Lovell, who crashed out when well placed on the circuit of Ireland, planning to take things a little gently early on, Terry Harriman in the co driver's seat. Penty Auricola, winner of the opening round in Yorkshire, provider of endless entertainment on the circuit of Ireland, just the same in the early stages in Wales. Malcolm Wilson with a six-speed gearbox in the Astra GTE. Wilson in pursuit of Auricola at Landau. Two laps of the stage required, so next time round it's Auricola in pursuit of Mark Lovell. Yeah, 
Auricula can afford to throw the Mitsubishi about, but in a few stages' time, those tire barriers will become logs and trees. Other runners, the Skodas, first and second in their class on the circuit of Ireland, entries once again for John Horgland and Warren Hunt. <laughs> And the Peugeots, already locked in their usual tight personal battle, Callie Grundle ahead in the 309 GTI, hotly pursued by teammate Louise Aitken Walker in the 205 GTI. And Phil Collins having problems like everyone else on this tight corner at Butte Park. At least two or three seconds there, and he's coming up to the next game now. Let's see if he's learned well. Arnie Stenshorn in a Lancia oh, well. Delta making hay at the same corner. <laughs> at Landau, the competition sometimes getting a little intense. Bertie Fisher powers his Cosworth Sierra inside the Group N version of Gwyndaf Evans. After all the entertainment of the spectator stages, we emerged with a leaderboard headed by Jimmy McRae with co-driver Rob Arthur. Second place, Penty Auricola and Ronan McNamee in the Mitsubishi Storion. Mark Lovell, surprisingly off the pace in the first five stages, dropping down to eighth as the field approached the forest sections. Unlike previous Welsh rallies, there were no more tarmac stages to come, much to the regret of Phil Collins, a renowned tarmac expert. skirmish almost over and the cars now heading to the Breckford Forest Complex, a total of 40 forest stage miles without service, more familiar Welsh terrain. Despite the early rain, the stage is very dusty and straight into the lead, the Mitsubishi of Penti Auricola. Consistently quick times and problems for the other runners gave Auricola a three second lead after nine stages. Those problems also meant that Torbjörn Edling had fought his way into second place ahead of Llewellyn's Quattro. Llewellyn with a small power steering problem on the car that was otherwise performing well. But that problem didn't prevent him taking an occasional hand off the wheel. Jimmy McRae's problem had been a puncture a mile from the end of a stage. He lost a minute with that and with the lack of service was forced to use worn tyres on the rear. Despite all those setbacks, McRae also in a relaxed frame of mind. McRae down to fourth, about 30 seconds ahead of Mark Lovell's Sierra. Lovell had recovered from his slow start from the spectator stages to be challenging for the lead by stage eight, but lost time after a spin dropped him back down the order. In sixth, it's Malcolm Wilson and Ian Grinrod in their Vauxhall Astra GTE. Malcolm going steadily and very happy with the new six-speed gearbox. Also upgraded suspension on the car, which was working well on the rough stages. The next step forward for Malcolm should be the arrival of the 16 valve Astra, which is scheduled to make its first appearance on the Ulster. The Peugeot of Cali Grundle seventh, both Grundle's 309 and Louise Aitken Walker's 205 had extensive work done to the engine management system since the circuit of Ireland, and as a result, both had about an extra 15 horsepower to play with. <laughs> on the
on board with Phil Collins in time for a rather nervous moment in the Sierra Cosworth. Collins with Brian Thomas alongside him, making only slow progress up the leaderboard, lying ninth after nine stages. of a reintroduction to the forest for Collins because of one problem or another he'd reckoned he clocked up only about a hundred forest miles since last year's Scottish but he wasn't making too many mistakes Collins then ninth behind a running order that had Auricula leading from Edling, then David Llewellyn, Jimmy McRae, Mark Lovell, Malcolm Wilson just ahead of Callie Grundle in seventh. Grundle's teammate Louise Aitken Walker had lost about a minute after a puncture and then a spin, so Louise, well out of the top ten, determined to make up ground and especially to mount a serious attack on the other front wheel drive challengers, the Astras. Leading challenger in the up to 1600cc class, once again, Graham Middleton in the Toyota. On to Crooken and Esker David, and the battle at the front of the field couldn't be tighter. Just three seconds covering the first three cars, still Auricula leading from the Audi of Llewellyn and the Mazda of Edley. On the faster stages like this, the advantage certainly seemed to be with the Mitsubishi against the heavier Audi. but Llewellyn in just the position he wanted to be, a position from which to challenge for his first victory on his home event. Fourth place, McRae, just 15 seconds off the lead. Malcolm Wilson in sixth, ahead of Grundle's Peugeot, and the new partnership with co-driver Ian Grinrod now working extremely well. Wilson soon had to force his way past the Mazda of Sundstrom to take fourth. Sundstrom would exit overnight with a blown turbo. Callie Grundle in seventh, plagued at this point with an overheating problem, but Grundle still staying ahead of the Sierra Cosworth of Phil Collins. <laughs> Collins still having a good steady drive. A couple of wrong tyre choices have prevented him from making a more concerted attack, but things still looking pretty exciting from the back seat. Aitken Walker here in the Peugeot was just outside the top ten and would establish herself among the top runners overnight. And apparently taking charge overnight to the delight of the home support, David Llewellyn. Llewellyn went ahead as Auricula hit temporary gearbox problems. Now here on the long Haffron stage, Llewellyn was 26 seconds ahead and the event had only 42 more miles left to run. Could this at last be Llewellyn's long-awaited home victory? Auricula, with his gearbox sorted, gives chase, but the Audi seems to hold all the advantages. Auricula clearly attacking, and then high on the mountainside, Llewellyn hits an enormous problem. The leader rolled, and he'll now need the spectators' help to get back in the event. Auricula takes the lead, Jimmy McRae seemingly promoted to second, but at this point unaware of the disaster that's befallen Llewellyn. 
The spectator warns McRae of the problem around the next corner. Let's watch that again. It seemed that Llewellyn clipped a pile of logs on an awkward, slippery corner and just couldn't keep the heavy Audi together. Onto his roof, a burst of flame, but the spectators got the car back on its wheels by the time McRae arrived right behind him. The Audi pouring tire smoke and dust into the windscreen of the Open Champion, Llewellyn carrying on, but how much further can he get? Well, the answer is not very far. Emergency service at the end of the stage reveals a bent subframe along with the rest of the damage. Llewellyn's Welsh challenge is over, heartbreakingly close to victory. Well, it was just um, a, a patch of mud over a crest. I mean, it was a very slight corner. And uh, with the car being quite heavy, that when you hit a piece of mud, of course, the, the weight just takes it off. And uh, we just hit a pile of logs on the outside and just sort of rode over them and went upside down just after. It damaged the subframe, bent it too badly for the boys to repair. They did try desperately for a quarter of an hour to try and keep us going, but, uh, but they failed. I've wanted to do well on the Welsh for the last five years, five years. so uh, um, um, it just, just doesn't treat me well, Wales, at all. Nobody wanted to take any more risks as the rain came down, especially not Penty Auricola, almost a minute in front and heading for his second victory of the season. Equally, Jimmy McRae happy to settle for the runners-up spot after his victory in the last round. The surprising speed of the two-litre Astra giving Malcolm Wilson third spot after his third place in Ireland. Then a splendid fourth on his first contest in Wales, Torbjorn Edling. But having to fight all the way for fifth, Phil Collins. Now try not to think about the drop on the left as you watch the moment that Collins has here. Collins surviving to confirm a fifth place that was very hard earned indeed. Mark Lovell sixth and may be a little disappointed with that. By the end, he dropped almost a minute behind Collins. Seventh place, a fine result after her earlier problems, Louise Aitken Walker in the Persia. And taking eighth, despite a small spin, four stages from home, Dave Metcalf, Astra GTE. Forcing his way into ninth to take Group N honors, Windaf Evans. And making up the top 10, the cadet GSI of Mats Jonsson. Borgland, the top Skoda, but no class honours. The up to 1300cc class was taken by Colin McRae in the Nova. But overall success, once again, went to Penti Auricola in the Mitsubishi Starion. Congratulations, Penti. Well done. Penti co-driven, as ever, by Ronan McNamee. Dab hands at the champagne now as they record their second win of the season. The Mitsubishi, after the success in Yorkshire, proving it's no fluke in Wales. Pent is winning margin 28 seconds over Jimmy McRae. And Malcolm Wilson, his second third place in successive events. Drivers' Championship shows Auricola with a commanding 14-point lead over Louise Aitken Walker, with McRae another seven points back, Dave Metcalf fourth, Phil Collins fifth. And it's Ford's Manufacturers' Championship at the moment, a 16-point lead over Vauxhall, with Peugeot third. The Scottish Rally. A dusty car breaker of an event. 1976, Ari Vatanen, a casualty in his escort. A broken differential when well placed, and as ever in the sport, rivals like GM's Tony Fall can be expected to be gently sympathetic. Oh, well, never broken. No one carries. Has it broken on the stage? Yes. 
Uh, did he stop in the stage? One finger finger. No, we didn't stop still. We oh. just came rolling down and still we have the same doors also. Oh, well, you're going to have care of um, Yeah, yeah, on that one, but we can't carry on, I mean. Well, why can't you change it? I think you've got another one. We haven't got any spare one. Ah. No one has got it, that's right. You see. In fact, the only possible spare is in the holiday traffic passing a few yards away. Ken Brown from Nottingham, on a touring holiday of Scotland, suddenly finds himself part of the Ford rally effort. The differential on his Capri is currently a thing of great value. Ford competition manager Peter Ashcroft supervises the transplant. These were the days when drivers and senior personnel were all used to getting their hands dirty. <laughs> Button and on his way, the result of the kind of improvisation that even the most sophisticated team has sometimes to rely on. Ken Brown's holiday, mind you, has temporarily come to a halt. The thing I think to do is to get hooked into the dealer down the road yeah. and get them to put a new, either a new axle in complete or a new battle mill opinion and just send the bill to me, I'll give you another time. Ten years later and nothing could save the MG Metro 6R4s. First Wilson was a victim of the dust, then it invaded the engine compartment of McRae. Llewellyn was soon to retire for the same reason. This was the year that Mark Lovell was going especially well in the Ford, until this happened. year we saw Llewellyn in the Audi, McRae in the Ford Sierra Cosworth, battling a little too closely for the lead at Knockhill. This was Jimmy McRae's 13th Scottish, he'd never won it, five times he'd finished a runner-up on his home event. In 87 he led until the final night, pushed hard by Llewellyn. You could see that, you know, the pressure was on him, I've never seen Jimmy like that, he was a bit tense and, you know, he wasn't quite his normal cool self. And uh, we knew that the first stage at 2 o'clock the next morning was very twisty and would suit our car. And um, we went in and had a good attack on that stage. And, of course, at night, where Jimmy doesn't go quite so quickly as in the daylight, we did actually start to catch him on that stage. And we got within, sort of, uh, 30 seconds of him. And we were coming down one side of the valley, and he was going up the other. And, of course, he saw our lights, made a small mistake and uh, hit the back of the car and lost a bit more time. So we took, I think, 35 seconds out of him on that one stage. Steady, steady. Don't let his lies worry you. By the next morning, Llewellyn was victorious. McRae runner-up for the sixth time, but could he make it at last in 1988, the British Midland Scottish Rally? Big Audi 200 Quattro looking for his first win of the season after a roll cost him victory in the last round, the Welsh. McRae with Rob Arthur alongside him leading the Ford Challenge in the Sierra Cosworth. Dust always a feature of the Scottish and this year it was worse than ever. Another strong challenger, Didier Oriol from France, double French champion and winner of this year's World Championship Corsica Rally. Another feature of this year's Scottish, the introduction of pace notes, the first time on a British forest event. Inside the Mitsubishi Starion, Penty Auricula behind the wheel, Ronan McNamee on the notes. There's suddenly left five into right three. You can see the extent of the dust problem here as the car set out on a first day loop of the southern Scottish forests. Penty Auricula struggling in the dust cloud thrown up by a slower car in front and being hampered as a result. Handbrake. Mm -hmm. 
Malcolm Wilson, a former Scottish Rally winner, starting superbly in the Vauxhall Astra GTE. Wilson into second behind McRae in the opening stages, leading many of the more powerful cars. Mark Lovell, the 1986 champion, not doing a full championship season in 1988. Lovell running in the thick of the dust. As indeed was Russell Brooks making his first championship appearance, not in the Opel Manta, his familiar car of recent seasons, but in a Ford Sierra Cosworth, and like so many of the rest of the field, having to contend with early puncture problems. Louise Aitken Walker, on familiar ground, in the Peugeot 205. Teammate Callie Grundle in the Peugeot 309. Jimmy McRae storming into the lead and sending the dust and rocks flying as he takes fastest time on the first seven stages. Missing at this point, David Llewellyn stuck in the forest with a fuel pump problem. So into second on his first visit to the Scottish forests, Didier Orio. Benty Auricola was doing his best to keep up the pressure. And left three, into left two, suddenly right four, 50. Left three, 50, long crest, right four, into left five. Penty, unhappy with the ride height on the Mitsubishi, was also delayed by gearbox problems, so his challenge hadn't really materialized yet. The Peugeot challenge was just about halved. Louise Aitken Walker would crash out after only three stages. Malcolm Wilson still running superbly, holding on to a top five place at the end of five stages. Right behind him and getting more and more used to the Ford Sierra Cosworth, Russell Brooks. John Hawkland Skoda set for its usual class battle with the Novas and a setback already as he loses four minutes with a puncture. But not as big a setback as that for Llewellyn. His fuel pump problem cost him 11 minutes. You know, 11 minutes is a lifetime in this game. And we've had a puncture since as well, so Scotland hasn't been too kind to us, really. In fact, it was the fuel pumps uh, after. I mean, uh, I'd just about given up and thought, well, I can't find it. And uh, I just had one sort of last check over in the boots, the uh, pumps are in the boots, and found the wire had actually broken on a connection and uh, fixed it and off we went. Everyone had their problems early on, but McRae, leading from Penty Auricola and Didier Oriol at Castle Douglas, had only minor irritations to report. Yes, we had a bit of a misfire in that stage, but I think it was just the heat and the fuel vaporisation. When I put it onto the other pump, the cooler fuel pump, it was all right. I think Didier was going very well. Uh, he went off the road for about half a minute in uh, A Forest, uh, but he's still, he's still there or thereabout. Penty's obviously uh, about the same pace. Cray in the clear air of Karochtri Forest, sending out a great rooster trail of dust, still troubled by that misfire, but still leading. Didier Oriol had set his second fastest time of the day on stage 10, but here on 12 was having problems, losing both third gear and his intercom to co-driver Bernard Ocelli. But the majority of the top 10 would move up a place after Oriol suffered a three minute delay with a puncture. Problems at the back? Well, this is Vince Wetton using the ricochet approach at the sharp left hander, a lot more productive than the straight on approach of Warren Hunt. As ever, willing hands would appear from the forest and Warren Hunt would be on his way before the dust has settled. Those out of it though on day one, David Llewellyn still running at the back of the field but Louise Aitken Walker is now out and joined by Peugeot teammate Callie Grundle, who retired with a blown head gasket. So end of day one, Jimmy McRae led from Malcolm Wilson, Penty Auricola third, Russell Brooks fourth. So into day two and the anti-clockwise loop of stages north. McRae leading Wilson and Auricola in the clear air at the front of the field. De Villa Forest was among the really testing forest stages of the day, and it saw McRae fastest again. Penty Auricola, third placed in the Mitsubishi Starion.
right four, suddenly left four long, and junction left seven. Junction left seven. 50, left six stone inside, into junction, junction left seven. Rickle are about to hit gearbox problems. There'd be a gearbox failure straight after this stage, requiring a complete rebuild on the earliest possible road section. Russell Brooks fourth, and it was back down the field that the dust was providing a real visibility problem, even with the organizers running some stages at two minute intervals. Wilson struggling for tyre choice on the punishing terrain and the task for Wilson was to try and hold Russell Brooks at bay who was charging in third. Brooks with Neil Wilson alongside him in the Ford Sierra Cosworth. But we go on board with Auricola and McNamee in the fourth place Mitsubishi Storian. And crest left five into right four. Auricula fourth, but losing ground. He's had further puncture problems and now feels that the Mitsubishi is down on power. Crest right three and right four. Suddenly left five. Suddenly right five. And right four, suddenly left seven, 50, crest right two inside, into left three, 110, left two long, into crest right four inside. Colin McRae still in the top ten, but now ninth with Oriole past him. The teams are often cocooned in their own little world, unaware of the shape of the overall contest. For this, they rely on the rally information service run by Brian and Liz Patterson, and it's giving Colin McRae only good news. Oh, we seem to be doing quite well according to this. <laughs> I hope it's correct. <laughs> Looking through the entry list at the start, there was such a good entry with all the Finnish and the Swedish junior teams. We never thought we'd be this high up. His father, Jimmy McRae, knows all about his own position into the final day and still in the lead. His 14th attempt at the Scottish Rally, six times second. Now he's listening for all the telltale noises from the car that could yet deprive him of the long-awaited Scottish win. But the problems would never materialise. Jimmy McRae is on his way to victory at last. Malcolm Wilson, a spirited second, but only just. His engine, showing signs of the dust that was getting everywhere, was on the point of giving up the ghost. Russell Brooks also only just survived after hitting a rock. He shattered a sump in his Ford Sierra Cosworth, but came home third. His talents sorely missed from the championship this year. Penty Auricola nursing home a Mitsubishi that had recurrent gearbox problems, but Auricola and McNamee fourth and keeping a strong hold on the championship. Fifth place, Phil Collins. He had been pressured by Oriol, but the Frenchman had gone off the stage in the night in one of the few places that there weren't any spectators to get him back. So, a good result for Collins. And sixth place, Mark Lovell. No concerted Open Championship programme for him, but he's the newly crowned Dutch champion, and this event for him was followed by success on the Donegal Rally. Ninth and winning his up to 1300cc class, Colin McRae in the Vauxhall Nova. Great day for the McRae's. Colin McRae showing he's got all the potential to match his father's long awaited Scottish victory. So McRae wins his home event after 14 attempts from Malcolm Wilson in second, Russell Brooks third, and championship leader Auricola fourth.
Auricula's lead, 16 points over McRae, two rounds left, the next being in Ulster in a little over a month. But for Jimmy McRae, one of the empty chapters in his illustrious career has now been completed. Well, I had to win it this year before he got anything a bit quicker because uh, I don't think it'll be so long before another Scotsman wins the Scottish Rally. Oh, next year, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Round five, the Ulster Rally, where each year you believe a car can fly. <laughs> Cars launch themselves over Hamilton's Folly, but they don't always land too well. David Llewellyn has broken a rotor arm with that landing on the 1987 event. Time for another bit of rally improvisation. <laughs> Juan Vestas sorts out the Audi as Russell Brooks heads by. The 1987 Ulster Rally, the last event for the Group B Manta in the Shell Oils Open Championship. Neither Russell nor co-driver Mike Broad expected the car to go out with quite this kind of bang. 200. Flat right, 100. Flat left over crest, 500. Rob's has gone, destroyed. See if we can pull him in on the left. That is the end of our rally. Goodbye. While that was going on, Mark Lovell was heading to his first ever victory on the championship. He'd taken the title the previous year more by consistency than winning drives. But he wasn't a contender for the title in 1988, as the championship headed to round five, the British Midland Ulster Rally. After Jimmy McRae's emphatic and long-awaited success in the forests of Scotland in the last round, it was back to high-speed tarmac for round five, starting and finishing in Belfast. The inevitable rain had made conditions very tricky, but Mark Lovell here was able to equal the times of McRae. Fastest of all, though, Phil Collins, a man with a renowned tarmac reputation. Penty Auricola lying fourth in his Mitsubishi Storion. Uncertain braking was his main concern. Similar problems were giving Malcolm Wilson the occasional early fright in the Vauxhall Astra GTE. The front-wheel drive contest looked interesting not only with the Astras, but also with Simon Davison, who's always strongly competitive in his VW Golf GTI. Dave Metcalf, Vauxhall Astra GTE. Other front-wheel drive contenders, Callie Grundle and his Peugeot teammates, Louise Aitken-Walker and Ellen Morgan. 30. 30. Flat right over brow into medium left. Callie's off. Flat right and easy right. Flat left. 30. Flight right into long, long slight left. Mid-stage and Ellen Morgan has pointed out Callie Grundle's Peugeot 309 half in a ditch. Louise and Ellen complete the stage. Back on the road, Grundle's challenge is rapidly disappearing. Easy left to stop. Oh, that was slippy. See, Kelly? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing you can do. Louise wonders whether there was any assistance they could have given. A couple of spectators had already provided the push that the Swede needed to get back on the stage. He'd rejoined just ahead of John Hogland's Skoda, but now it was straight to service to assess the damage. <laughs> At first sight, the damage appears only superficial, a couple of crumpled panels, but the damage to his effort on the Ulster is very significant. Grundle's mistake costing him over four minutes. 
We just hit the mast, came in very understeers. I have to take the handbrake and save the car in the last minute. They were standing nearly on the road, but no chance to come up ourselves. So one person, he came and helped us. Then it was stopped on the road again. It was very unfortunate because his car was tilted and uh, the front wheels were nearly off the ground. So he couldn't, the front wheel drive, he could hardly get it back on the road. But uh, come around the corner and you're a bit committed and then there could be muck in the road and you just slide, slide all over the place. You can't do anything about it. You've just got to steer the car as best as possible. And medium right. At the front of the field, Jimmy McRae, with Rob Arthur alongside him, was now beginning to show his authority. A couple of fastest times helped him pull out a 20-second lead on the rest of the field. The rest of the field, that is, apart from Lovell, whose attacking driving kept him within a few seconds. This is Yump Country, high-speed jumps that can look spectacular, but can easily put you out of the event. So, one of the rare moments of extra caution for Lovell, but a terrific duel between the two was starting to develop. With six stages gone, there was only a few seconds between McRae and Lovell. Phil Collins was trying equally hard, but had dropped almost 30 seconds further back in third. Fourth place, championship leader Penty Auricula. Fifth, another solid looking drive developing from Malcolm Wilson in the Astra GTE. And he, like Auricula and McRae, is a driver still with a definite chance of the overall title. Sixth place, the right hand drive Astra of Dave Metcalf, about 15 seconds behind. And as ever, taking the battle to the fellas in no uncertain fashion, Louise Aitken Walker and Ellen Morgan in their Peugeot. Absolute brow 30, we jump 30, turn hard 90 right. 30, absolute left over brow 50. Quick left and long easy right. Flat left, 30, jump, 30, quick right over brow and jump, 50, long flat right, wee bumps, 30, quick right maybe, 50, quick left over brow, 30. At this point, the first dramatic development on that lead of orders. Penty Auricula, a taxi yump, lands heavily. The car seems undamaged, but Penty has painfully ricked his back and he wouldn't be able to continue. Behind the slowing Mitsubishi on the stage are Louise and Ellen. 30. Easy left over brow. 100 to stop. OK. Penty must have a problem, huh? Penty pays the painful price of the Ulster Yumps. It won't deter others, though. That was Simon Davison taking a big risk with his seventh position, but top prize for distance, style and resultant damage goes to Vince Wetton. All will surely be put right at service at the end of a day that saw McRae leading Lovell by just a single second. For McRae, most attention at service was being paid to brakes. As soon as they get there, they get too hot, they get too quickly. They get top again. Top again. Lovell was similarly preoccupied, all a symptom perhaps of the increasing power of these cars. I don't know, I think the Group A cars have got a bit quicker now. Since last year, we were looking at the times over some of the stages and they're a bit quicker. And, you know, the cars have got quicker and the brakes are the same. So, uh, obviously, they had taken more of a pounding. It's going to be a different rally tomorrow. The stages out that way are a bit longer. A bit more bumpy as well, so um, anything can happen. It'll be a good run for sure. McRae leading into the second day, but a casualty toward the end of day one had been Louise Aiken Walker with a broken throttle linkage. The battle at the front, however, quite compelling. Lovell always threatening to overhaul McRae, but hampered by a problem with the differential, a problem which was heightened because of the slippery conditions. 
The third Sierra Cosworth was still that of Phil Collins, but he'd soon crash out, making it a straight fight between McRae and Lovell for victory. The front-wheel drive cars didn't seem to be especially hampered by the conditions. Malcolm Wilson kept fourth, but growing quicker and ever more confident, Dave Metcalf in fifth. Simon Davison going as hard as he could in the Golf GTI, but unable to make any great impression on Metcalf or Wilson. Leo Shaw lying seventh and leading the Group N showroom class. This is the second David Sutton prepared Golf GTI of Andrew Wood, also well placed despite this mistake, lying eighth behind Shaw and Davison. Chris Birkbeck's Astra rounding off the front-wheel drive contest, but things were about to be resolved at the front of the field. McRae, despite the need for aggression, was encountering few problems. But Lovell, plagued by the differential trouble, had gambled on slick tyres in the damp conditions in a final effort to close the gap, and the gamble hadn't paid off. The Cosworth had hit a bump with four stages left and slid into a ditch. The time lost on the stage is obvious from the proximity of Malcolm Wilson. The time spent in repairing the damage... Forward. Well, you know, we've, we've had diff trouble earlier on, and we were 34 seconds behind Jimmy with just these four stages to go. So um, we put slicks on, and as you can well see from the weather today, it was a bit of a brave move. And uh, we were just going uh, balls out, as they say. Co-driver Terry Harriman's job, among much else, is to worry about the timings. No time left, and without doubt, Lovell was now clocking up road penalties. No time for an artistic approach from the mechanics, Lovell had to get back on the road. threat to McRae was now removed, safely heading to his third win on the Ulster, and along with his six wins on the circuit of Ireland, he shows his love of competition in this part of the world. Mark Lovell had made a terrific fight of it though, and the state of his car clearly demonstrated that he definitely hadn't been settling for second. Malcolm Wilson can always be relied upon for a place in the top three, and with the demise of Phil Collins, once again, he'd achieved that. The Astra GTE, winner of the recent New Zealand World Championship round, increasingly impressive, emphasised by Dave Metcalf's strong drive into fourth. Next came the VW Golf GTIs, Simon Davison fifth. And Andrew Wood sixth. and a very fine seventh place by Midlander Ian Tilk in his Sierra Cosworth. One of the best drives of the rally, though, came from Callie Grundle. Last after his mistake early on, he'd forced his way into eighth at the finish. And Group N success, and therefore the Group N championship, went to Gwyndaf Evans, that after Leo Shaw had dropped out with overheating problems. But for the third time this season, the victor's champagne went to Jimmy McRae and Rob Arthur, ultimately over five minutes ahead of last year's winner, Mark Lovell. The result of a rally that saw 61 starters, 34 finishers, and absent from that finishing order, the all-important name. Which means that Jimmy McRae takes over at the head of the championship, nine points clear of Auricola, 15 clear of Wilson. All three have a chance of the title in yet another final round showdown on the Isle of Man. But the best chance of all lies with a driver in form, Jimmy McRae. The Manx Rally then, the customary decider to the Shell Oils RAC Open Championship, rarely is tarmac rallying as exhilarating as on the Isle of Man. The more winner Derek Bell, an admiring spectator, Ari Vatanen and Terry Harriman, Isle of Man, 1983. Bill Collins, almost as exciting, in 1987. 
But under pressure from the flying Jimmy McRae and Mark Lovell, he ran out of luck on the first stage of the second day. Probably if I break 10 yards earlier, which is probably something like an 80th of a second or whatever somebody could calculate it out at, then I would have got away with it. And when you're trying to beat a guy like Jimmy McRae and Mark Lovell, when you're in this sport and you're competitive, you'd like to win. And I very, very much would like to have won this rally. And in my efforts, it just went slightly wrong. For Jimmy McRae last year, victory would give him the title. Things got off to a rather indifferent start. Oh, bastard. McRae recovered from that to take the Shell Oils Open Championship. Now on the Tudor Wabasto Manx, he's out to beat Roger Clark's record by taking the title for the fifth time. The Isle of Man, late summer. Always the time and the place for the climax of the Shell Oils RAC Open Championship. Always a contest down to the wire. Of the three remaining contenders for the title, Jimmy McRae was in the driving seat in more ways than one. McRae, the championship leader, ponders the tactics. I don't know, it's very difficult because we have a, you know, we have a championship to think of. Uh, I think Mark will be the man. I think he's, he's got uh, nothing to lose and everything to gain, so I think he'll go for it. But it depends what's happening in the rest of the field, especially with Malcolm Wilson and Penty Auricula. Penty Auricula, contender number two. Well, I think, uh, quite frankly, that even if we win and, and Jimmy still goes well, uh, he's going to win the championship, so we can't really win the championship by winning this rally. Uh, but on the other hand, if we drop out from the rally, say very early from the rally, then uh, we will lose the rally championship, that's sure. So we have to finish to win the championship, so that's the, definitely the aim. Contender number three, Malcolm Wilson, Astra GTE. Well, I see that as a very outside chance really to win the title. And um, I think obviously Jimmy and Penty would have to have major problems. Um, if, if they did retire, I think all we would have to do is obviously finish in the top ten, which I think is quite possible. But then for the event itself, there's a lot of quick Europeans here. And with the rally really being much shorter in the, the fact that there's not so many different stages, um, they're not going to be at as big a disadvantage as they've been in probably previous years. So I think, I think we'll see a lot of the foreigner drivers going very quick this year. The best possible finish would not only give McRae the 1988 title, it would give the Scotsman the championship for a record fifth time. He knows the tight lanes of the Isle of Man as well as anyone. It will definitely be a case of not taking unnecessary risks, not breaking the car, not jeopardizing the title. But even that kind of approach can look spectacular. Looks can be deceptive. This is McRae driving at only 85%, but in touch with the early leaders in the opening stages. But among those leaders were drivers not so much interested in the Manx for its Open Championship status as for the European Championship points it offered. This is the Belgian Patrick Snyers, more than matching McRae's pace in the BMW M3, run by the ProDrive team, but also run Frank Sittner's car that heads the British Touring Car Championship. Snyers a leading contender in the European Championship, but this is the European leader, Fabrizio Tabaton, in the Lancia Delta Integrale. Third leading European entry, Robert Drugman from Belgium in the Ford Sierra Cosworth. None of them were a threat to McRae's British Championship prospects, but all of them wanted to win the rally. But perhaps none wanted to win as much as Mark Lovell. No championship at stake for him, but a lot to prove. The ambition didn't last long. Although he led early on, engine failure put Lovell and co-driver Terry Harriman out of the Manx after only a handful of stages. It's a bit hot at the end of the first stage, and then um, it was just getting hotter and hotter, so basically it was on its way out, and there's no point in blowing it to pieces. Um, although it's not mine, this, this doesn't achieve anything. Great shame. Very bad. Stuffed it to them, you know. Back 
with the Open Championship battle, Malcolm Wilson had made a steady start in the Astra GTE, but delayed a little perhaps by the wrong tyre choice. Pentia Ricola's tyre problems have been more fundamental, with a puncture seriously delaying him and co-driver Ronan McNamee. Then just as he was fighting his way back into the top ten, another problem. Auricola, having clouted a bank, makes a crab-like passage through the stage, the right rear wheel wanting to head off on a rally of its own. Skillful bit of driving to keep the time lost to a minimum, and the skills of his crew at the next service put matters to rights. Louise Aitken Walker taking things very gently. Not the neatest corner she's ever driven, but Louise was once again the front-running Peugeot. Phil Collins was the first day star of last year's Manx, leading the event until he hit a bridge on the second day. He started this year with similar commitment, holding fourth. Commitment was the key word among all the leaders. Dave Metcalf adding to the smell of burning rubber that hung heavy on the first day. Patrick Snyers had stretched out a lead of 34 seconds over McRae at the end of the first day, and it was easy to see why. Just watch this for a breathtaking display of forceful driving. Jimmy McRae just had to keep himself in check. The championship was his for the taking if he just finished in a respectable position. But the Open champion elect must have been sorely tempted to put his foot down and do battle with the European champion elect. Drugman was Snyer's nearest European championship challenger and he was lying third at the end of the day. Then came Phil Collins in fourth, driving easily as well as he had done a year before. This was illustrated by his position ahead of Fabrizio Tabaton in the Lancia Delta Integrale, the European Championship leader. Malcolm Wilson had got past his teammate Dave Metcalf and up to sixth in the Astra GTE. However, if you were looking at the cars and not at the stopwatch, you'd swear that Metcalf was the faster man. Pentia Ricola now, the wheels pointing in the right direction most of the time. He was past Louise Aiken Walker into eight. Once again, Ronan McNamee with the pace notes was trying to steer his man clear of further problems. Into junction, left one. Into left two. Into crest, left one minus, suddenly left side jump one. Into left one and right one. Into right one minus. The fate of the championship title was clearly in the hands of McRae, but Auricola hadn't given up hope of a victory that could snatch the title away. 100, right 1 minus, 200, junction left 6 minus, hairpin. Into right 6, 50, right 4, short. And jump two into left three minus long. Luck wasn't going the way of the fin, though. A puncture and more precious seconds lost. Peugeot's filled the ninth and tenth places. Louise Aitken Walker, ninth. Michael Sundstrom in the 309 GTI, tenth.
The second day had the longest schedule of the three-day competition. Similar stages used, and the Belgian Snyers was confident that he knew them well. Foreign drivers are generally thought not to enjoy the fast, narrow, twisting tarmac stages so typical of the Manx. Snyers was clearly the exception, and the rest of the field were unable to make any inroads on his lead. Not that that was unduly worrying to McRae. His concern was that the car should last, not letting him down on the last lap of the championship. And in this respect, the Sierra Cosworth was giving him a trouble-free run. McRae three times a winner of the Manx, and if he could pass Nyers, he would equal Tony Pond's record of four Isle of Man victories. Of the cars chasing McRae, one was about to disappear. Robert Drugman has clipped a rock, the wheel has been forced back into the arch, and now everything is coming apart, including his last remaining hope of the European title. Phil Collins, as a result, was a more solid third. Drugman's demise of great benefit to Tabaton in the European Championship. This the British debut of the Lancia Integrale that has so dominated the World Championship. But on the Manx day two, it's giving second best to two Fords and a BMW. And there were occasions when the Astra GTE was matching the pace of the Lancia, especially in the hands of Malcolm Wilson. Wilson fifth. And Dave Metcalf here sixth. But another casualty at this stage was Michael Sundstrom, out of the event with engine problems. Pentia Ricola, seventh in the Mitsubishi Ryan, accepts that he can no longer win the championship by good driving, but he can lose it by bad driving. Either way, there's a lot of sound, fury, and tire smoke. Louise Aiken Walker, now seventh, the last surviving Peugeot among the front runners following Sundstrom's demise. And this is Chris Birkbeck bringing a third Astra into the top ten, ninth place for him. Colin McRae is widely regarded as having the talent and ability of his father, a string of good results and some spirited drives in the Nova. He's probably sick of hearing that all he lacks is the experience of his father. But there's no shortage of youthful exuberance. Unfortunately, that doesn't always bring results, and a few miles further on, Colin McRae would complete the job by putting the Nova on its roof. But his day will come in the very near future. The Castle Town Spectator stage has now become an established part of the Manx. The stage was run at dusk this year, but neither the twilight, the harbour, the castle walls or the market square slowed the rally leader Snyers. This is the last stage of the second day, and McRae was still in touch, but now 44 seconds behind the Belgian. But there was no real challenge behind. Phil Collins was four minutes back. Tabaton, in fourth, seemed content with his second place in the European contest. Then came Wilson in the 16-valve Astra GTE, but Wilson was battling all the way with Auricola, who had now clouted a war in a rather incident-packed drive that was doing nothing to threaten McRae's championship prospects. Just 10 stages on the final day, a chance for exhibition stuff from Patrick Snyers, whose victory gives him the European Championship lead. His only regret was Drugman's demise, which didn't allow him to open as much of a gap on second place man Tabaton as he would have wished. But a drive that was among the most impressive on the Isle of Man in recent years.
been a happy hunting ground for McRae over the years as well. No victory, but a second place that guarantees him the championship, which he'll defend next year at the wheel of a Toyota. Almost seven minutes behind came Collins in third. All the frustrating Isle of Man memories of last year had been erased. This year, luck was on his side. This year, if Collins should stray from the straight and narrow, it wasn't into a brick wall. Tabaton in fourth, and now forced into second place in the European Championship, but only just behind Snyers. Malcolm Wilson fifth, and behind him, teammate Dave Metcalf has gone, crashing out in the closing stages. Something a lot of people predicted Penty Auricola would do, but despite collecting a few more creases, Penty survives in sixth place, ahead of Louise Aitken Walker. No championship then for Auricola, but from his first round victory in Yorkshire to the finale on the Isle of Man, Auricola has been the entertainer. And left two opens over Crest, 150. Crest, right three, into Crest one, and jump right three, cut into right one minus, into cattle grid, left four long, open, 50, oh. well held, left seven, hairpin. It's easy to see why the Mitsubishi Starion looks a little battle-weary. Auricola in sixth, ahead of Louise Aitken Walker. But winner of the Tudor Webasto Max Rally 1988, Patrick Snyers in the BMW M3, striking a blow for the European Championship in the first year it's become a part of this high-speed event on the Isle of Man. Snyers' victory giving him the championship lead over Tabaton, but only 40 points is the margin, and the issue will be decided on the forthcoming Cyprus rally. McRae was only 30 seconds behind at the finish, and with Collins third, Tabaton fourth, Wilson fifth, and Auricola sixth, five different manufacturers in the top six. McRae's title then, alongside co-driver Rob Arthur, Auricola, a fighter to the end, Wilson's third place, a reward for consistency and reliability. So the climax of another Shell Oils RAC Open Championship, McRae's fifth title, and throughout the 80s, he's taken on the very best of the opposition and every tough challenge of Britain's premier rally championship. Quick left. Quick right. 